listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answer for the Answers for the Family. I'm getting a bit of an echo, but I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and I'm flying solo today. My co-host, Dr. Matt Polachek, is focusing on his work as director of the Hazleton Betty Ford Center here in Los Angeles. But for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much. And continue to spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain, while bringing answers and options to many things that can make our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, Answers for the Family will address a variety of issues, such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. And we'll introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and fun for you and your family. Now, our topic today is the title of Dr. Burdick's new book, as well as our topic, which is 10 Steps to Wilderness Therapy. Now, dual licensed as both an educational and licensed psychologist in the U.S. and a U.K. chartered psychologist, Dr. Mark Burdick has served as chairman of the board of behavioral sciences for the state of California and as founder of Burdick Psychological and Placement Services International. Dr. Burdick manages an EU and UK agency and a U.S. consulting practice in uh, referring international families to programs domestically and internationally. Now, finding the perfect fit for the individual and the family in a therapeutic uh, setting is his mission, whether it's in the U.S. or abroad. Mark is also a graduate of of the American School in Lugano, Switzerland, and has traveled extensively. And if any of you know him, you know that you can get a call or a message from him from almost anywhere in the world. Also with us today is Dr. Stephen DeMille, and he is a licensed mental health counselor who has worked with struggling adolescents since 2000 where Stephen began his career in the helping profession by working with adolescents as a field guide at Redcliffe Ascent, a wilderness therapy program. Now, after completing his degree, Stephen began his clinical work as a therapist. He has worked in residential treatment, therapeutic boarding, community mental health, and for a foster care agency. However, most of his clinical work and his passion has been in wilderness therapy. Currently, Stephen is the executive director of Redcliffe Ascent and is heavily involved in promoting wilderness therapy and has held leadership positions with the Outdoor Behavioral Health Care Council and is actively involved in research and does presenting on wilderness therapy. Mark and Stephen, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks for the introduction. You're very welcome. And and when you guys answer, if you can give your name also, because many of the people out there, although I will know the difference in your in your voice, many of the people out there will not. So I would appreciate that. And what I'd like to do, because some of our listeners, they may not be familiar with wilderness therapy. So to start off with, can you please share what it is and what it's not? Mark? Go for it, Steve. All right, I'll I'll get it kicked off talking about wilderness therapy because this has been kind of my 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 passion. Um, Wilderness therapy was my my introduction really into the helping profession. Um, You know, in 2000, when I was first introduced to the helping profession, my draw to it necessarily wasn't um, wasn't actual psychology or therapy. Um, It was the outdoors. I found a job where I got to work in an outdoor setting with adolescents and and. So it's um, the integration of the outdoors and um, and helping and counseling has, has been an area of interest of mine since since I started in this. It's kind of what brought me to it. Um, so just a little bit about what wilderness therapy is and then maybe a little bit about what it isn't. Um, one of the things that I like about wilderness therapy is um, it is, uh, it, it's, although, although for many people it may be new, um, wilderness therapy has been around for a couple decades as we know it now, but even before that, I mean, 
for, for centuries, um, people have been going to nature and to the outdoors as a place of healing and change. Um, it's been in, in most uh, cultures around the world, um, there's been rituals around the outdoors, around life, uh, rites of passage, um, healing, change, and wilderness therapy has just become kind of our modern application of the use of nature as a place for change and a place for healing. Um, in essence, we've combined the wisdom of the past with what we know now about change and psychotherapy um, and uh, personality. And it's just kind of been our modern integration of the two, of these kind of these two worlds. And, and so wilderness therapy, um, it's the use uh, or the prescriptive use of the outdoors um, by licensed mental health professionals in order to achieve uh, a therapeutic or change goals. Um, and, and so, I mean, at, at its core, that, that's what it is. The, the delivery of it varies. Um, most of wilderness therapy occurs in an outdoor and a backcountry setting and involves some kind of ex extended travel and, and living. Um, you know, it's, it involves some of the traditional therapies that we know now, individual um, uh, group psychotherapy, uh, family therapy, um, you know, and, and some of the more traditional uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. And, um, yeah, was somebody trying to jump in there? No, I'm not sure, but uh, Stephen, what I, what 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 I like what you're doing is, I mean, you're bringing up the fact that this is not something new, and I think that's some of the things that I hear, and you know, as somebody who specializes in in intervention and in transport, I get parents that that are still fearful of this. So for them to be told that and to learn that this is something that has been going on for for decades, and it is it's something to where there is now. Um, you know, there, there are psychological um, papers that have been done. There, there are things that have been written out that have shown what some of the outcomes are. So there is some data out there so that they can see that it is not just their child is, is put out in, you know, in a teepee with two sticks to, to rub together for fire, that there is a, a, a psychological uh, focus that is geared towards taking them away from the environment that they were in, be it something yeah. to where they were addicted to drugs or or involved in a gang or something, and taking them out there and putting them in a situation that sort of opens them up to be able to now work with them in a very positive environment. Yeah, uh, yeah, this well, that and Steve, I was just going to jump in for a minute. I said this is actually what the book is about. And I don't know, Alan, if the listeners have that access to download the book, but there's a lot of information around the background of wilderness therapy. And then there's, of course, the inclusion of a journal article that Steve and I did for um, ODH. And it has a, a good um, entry level um, opportunity for parents to see what the outcomes uh, are indicating, how successful. Uh, such therapy can be and we used to call it back in the day that I was a school psychologist we would talk about diagnostic placements and we would have the the way to take the kind of the kids apart and look at them in a different setting and in a lot of ways Steve I think you would agree that this is really the richness of the wilderness setting is that it's not home it's it's a place that's that's safe and it's structured and yet it's, it gives us an opportunity to, to, to really get a, a mirror, uh, a light shined uh, on how those relationships go between the peers that are at over struggles. And that's something you can't replicate back at home in their therapist's office. It just, it doesn't work that way. Here, you have the opportunity to see how they engage with other peers. You get advice from peer to peer, along with line staff and with therapists. So it's really kind of a different uh, animal. Now, and Steve, um, if you can just touch on a little bit more in regards to what some of those psychological uh, components are that maybe some of the parents aren't thinking about when they're, when they're deciding on this really big decision for them. Right, right. And so um, there's, there's a few things that, that, that could be highlighted. Um, we get a sec, I, I wanna integrate in some of the research. So um, in terms of for, for parents, 
that are that have a of a struggling adolescence that that are in, in need of some kind of treatment. Um, you know, the wilderness does, in my opinion, three things really well, and, and I think it's a way for parents to be looking at their situation and determining, and is this is this a fit for me? Um, one of the things that I think the wilderness is uniquely good at, and we talked about this, but it's around disrupting systems. So when it's when an adolescence is is kind of trapped in a in an unhealthy system, whether that be peers or drugs or problems at school, the wilderness is uniquely powerful at being able to disrupt whatever is causing the distress, whatever is causing that individual or that family dysfunction. Um, because it is such a novel environment, it allows the child to re- to experience themselves in a new setting, in, a, in an unfamiliar um, environment. And as a result of that, you get greater levels of awareness and insight. So that's the other thing that the wilderness is, is uniquely and keenly good at, is working with somebody who maybe in the past hasn't been very good at taking responsibility for their difficulties, for what they're struggling with. Um, and, you know, as, as parents are trying to help them and intervene, you know, they're doing things to displace responsibility and blame others and so on. Um, when you're in that unique environment experiencing your behavior, you start to, ex- to see it differently and it creates a space for greater insight. And so kind of the second, you know, in addition to disrupting, the second most common thing that you see parents using the wilderness for is to create awareness and understanding. And that goes in both ways. It goes in terms of the, the adolescent creating better understanding for themselves, but additionally, it's an excellent environment to help others understand what's going on. It's, it's oftentimes used for diagnostic purposes, getting them sober, getting them away from all of the distractions and dysfunction, and getting a really good baseline of not just what the problems are. I mean, most families know what the problems are when, when they send them, but you get a really good baseline of who is this child? Who is my child? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Um, and you, you get it's an environment where you get just an exceptional baseline of this is who my kid is, you know, you know, strengths and weaknesses and all. And then, you know, I think the third thing that the wilderness is uniquely good at, um, and oftentimes can be maybe seen as counterintuitive, is oftentimes when a, you know, a parent is looking at the wilderness, oftentimes they're thinking, oh, this will be a great opportunity for my child to unplug, get them away from technology, they get them away from all of the distractions in the world. Um, and so oftentimes it's seen as a, as a way to unplug when in reality, when you're going to a wilderness program, the opposite is actually happening is when you're sending them into a wilderness setting, a wilderness setting is a community setting. It's all about community. And so what you're actually doing is you're saying you're sending them off to a place to teach them how to connect. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes actually it's the technology and all of these things that get in the way of our ability to connect with other people or to connect with ourselves. In a wilderness program, the focus there is about learning how to connect with yourself. What are my, how am I feeling? What are my experiences? Learning how to connect with your community, with your peers, learning how to connect with parents and authority figures. And so, you know, in, in you know, in looking at, a, you know, using is wilderness right? I mean, those are kind of the the three, or not the three, but those are three of probably the, the uniquely powerful aspects of the wilderness is it, it disrupts unhealthy systems. It's great at working with kids that have had multiple failed treatment attempts in the past. It's, an assess, it's a great environment for creating insight and assessment and then reconnecting and then reengaging in therapy or in meaningful activities. Okay. Um, and- and did Mark, I, did I well, your question there, Alan? Yeah, yeah. And, and I was just going to ask Mark. So, Mark, a, as a psychologist and an educational consultant, how do you use uh, wilderness therapy uh, to to help with your placements? Not only from the standpoint of that first step of wilderness, but then making the decision either from the standpoint of a therapeutic school or or the type of boarding school that might be a good fit for that particular child and for that family. I think that's an excellent, uh, this is Mark, of course, Alan, but I think that's an excellent question. Again, it is addressed in the e, in the e-book, uh, the iBook, and, and with this uh, article, that uh, the journal article that we did with an international family, you know, there was the opportunity within the wilderness setting to see how this individual would come out of their, I would say, punk, out of their depression, out of their dysthymic anxiety, 
and see how they would react when everything is taken away in terms of electronics and that family dynamic to allow them to, to make those individual relationships between peers. See how they see how they do it. See what how the motivation comes along and how they start to pull their own wagon, which is kind of a, a metaphor that I like to, to use with, with working with families. And then as you see what the struggles are, you can identify the struggles and sometimes there's struggles that you haven't even considered. There may, there may be trauma, uh, there may be more addiction that you were not necessarily thinking at the time, but then it's exposed that when they're in, in the, uh, the wilderness setting, there's things that come up. And as you get to know the kids better and they get to know themselves better, that leads you to discerning what the appropriate setting would be next for them. In other words, whether it would be, you know, residential treatment, if they need a, you know, a standard boarding school with some therapeutic support, if it's appropriate that they go home, what that aftercare would look like for them. So mm -hmm. it's very important because there you get the diagnosis and you can see where those kids are headed and what they need in terms of level of support. Now, and Mark, you, you mentioned the ebook. Um, now, first of all, for all of our listeners, just so that you know, uh, I've talked with Mark. The, the ebook is free to you. So, Mark, if somebody wants to download it, and again, for those of you that are at your, your computer, you can open up another, uh, another screen right now and download it and follow around, uh, you know, follow along with us. You know, obviously, if you're driving, don't try this, uh, but we will make sure that all the information is up on the Answers for the Family site that you can do that as well after the show. So, Mark, for those that want to download the ebook, uh, how are they going to do that? Well, you just go to Apple um, iBooks. If you have an Apple device, that's the easiest way to do it. So you go to your iTunes, uh, to your iBooks, and then you go and do a search for 10 steps the wilderness therapy and then you'll you'll find it you can put in my last name burdick b-u-r-d-i-c-k and it'll also take you right to that to that book um any device a phone um a uh, apple tv <laughs> an ipad whatever you have ipad is the best um computer as well um but i, w I would say this that's important with that that ibook that you know it's it's having worked with steve and working with you know, Red Cliff and working with, you know, good, solid wilderness programs is what really promoted this for me. And I found that there was so many things that we just kind of answered again and again for parents that it made sense, you know, to do a book that just kind of explained the process. That's great. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about who is a good fit, because I know that, again, it's one of those things that, that, that they will come to. The parents will talk to me. Uh, I've had, I can be at the gym, and, and those, those parents that know uh, what it is that I do uh, will come up and start telling me about the different issues that they're going through with their own family. I refer them to an educational consultant uh, that's in their area that can, that can handle that. Um, but for some of the parents that are out there listening and they're dealing with a variety of different issues, um, what are some of the things that are going on out there that you say to yourself, I think wilderness is probably a good fit? And, and at the same time, what ages do you think work best as far as uh, going through an outdoor behavioral health setting? So um, I'll start with the, the latter part of the question. Go ahead, and, and then I'll pass it off to Mark, you know, in terms of, you know, our, let me, let me add just kind of a little bit of a research lens to the question. I'll pass it off to Mark to ask it more general, you know, in terms of, you know, ages, who works well, um, there's, there's a very solid foundation of research that supports uh, um, wilderness therapy for adolescents with emotional problems. You know, that would be like depression, anxiety, you know, usually those, the, the kind of the manifestation of those problems are I'll get a call from parents and they'll be like, I can't get my kid to go to school. I just can't get them to engage. They, just, they game all of the time. And I think my kid has a gaming addiction. And, and oftentimes they, they or process addiction. Oftentimes they may, but they have an underlying emotional problem that they're, that they're coping with through that. Um, and so, you know, for adolescents that are struggling to engage emotionally and manage that appropriately, um, there's, there's a solid amount of research for behavioral problems, sneaking out at night, high family conflict, 
um, you know, just the difficulties in school, the acting out behaviors. Um, additionally, it kind of goes along with the acting out behaviors, oftentimes it's mixed up with it, are um, the attention and the impulse, you know, impulse control uh, difficulties. You know, there's quite a bit of research to support it in working with kids that have impulse control. Um, in addition to that, there's substance use that has a good amount of research for adolescents and so on. Um, the, in turn, there's kind of new research that's come out in the last few years looking at young adults. And so there's, there's a growing, adolescence has been, there's, you know, there's about 20 years of research to support it with adolescents, but we're actually seeing a lot more work with young adults um, in two areas, one in recovery that are in recovery from addiction. For those that have struggled in more traditional rehab programs, they're having a lot of luck in wilderness. And the other one is with emerging adults or failure to launch. Um, um, those young adults that are having a hard time, you know, engaging in the you know, activities that are associated with independence, self-sufficiency in adulthood. Um, there's, there's been some good research recently in, in helping emerging adults be able to engage in adulthood. Um, and so looking at it from that research lens, you know, those, that's kind of where the research lands. And Mark, I'd, you know, kind of, I know you're about to say something, so I'll hand it off to you to add to that. Well, I, I, this is Mark, and I would, go ahead, Alan. No, 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 go ahead. That, that was not me. That was, uh, it was a little bit of an echo uh, of your own voice. Oh, uh, so this is Mark, and I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's probably smart to talk a little bit about why you wouldn't send someone um, necessarily out to wilderness. And, and if you're looking at the you know, kind of active psychosis, or if you're looking at some sort of suicidal behavior, something that's very serious, but can't be worked out with a wilderness placement, then you're going to stay away from that. Um, you know, but you're looking at at risk behavior typically with those that are between the ages of, you know, 13 to 17. And then as Steve has pointed out, we have another, population that kind of emerges in the in the early um, adult from 17 up to 24, 25 years of age. And so you want to be sure that you intervene as, as quickly as possible and as, as um, early as possible because just like uh, any uh, human in skill development, you know, that it's easier um, that when kids are younger to get this kind of help because they, they take to it. And so it's, it's really positive to have this kind of uh, intervening done, um, you know, 14, 15 years of age. Sometimes you'll see kids that are down to 10 to 12 years of age, but that, that's kind of unusual. And that's as a result of maybe some other type of a diagnosis going on where they need some um, additional uh, support. But I think just you're looking at at risk, you're looking at, um, you know, risk to themselves or to others, you know, use of substances. Um, those are the things that you're going to be looking for when you, you make an appropriate placement that's based on behavioral issues. Now, we have a listener question that's coming in. Uh, and again, I want to thank those that take the time to do this. This one reads, I suggested to my daughter and son-in-law that uh, that my granddaughter would benefit from a wilderness program experience she, since she has been extremely difficult this last year and was le recently caught with marijuana and some illegal pills at school. Um, they are currently working with the system now to determine what their next step will be. Uh, my daughter is a little fearful about wilderness as another parent told her that her daughter returned with a back injury from carrying heavy packs and uh, that it took days to, and this says, I quote, to get all the dirt off of her. I can't imagine this happening, but thought I would ask, although everything I have read about these programs is positive and life-changing, and that's from Patricia in California. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, and I, so if, if, if each of you can address that a little bit, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I'll jump in there. And so... One of the difficult things, this is Steven, sorry, I'm not as good at, at Mark as identifying myself, so again, this is Steven. <laughs> um, one of the difficult things around wilderness therapy right now is anyone can call themselves a wilderness therapy program. Um, I could get a truck, a couple backpacks, and a handful of my friends, and I could call that a wilderness therapy program. So 
there's when when you're looking at a wilderness therapy program you know i think the first way first thing i need to answer that question is that not you know sadly it's not all created equal so some of the things that parents can do right out of the gates with this is one you want to look for a, a program that's licensed by their state as a wilderness therapy or the other term is outdoor behavioral health care program and you want a program that's accredited as an outdoor behavioral health care program. So there's an actual accreditation through AEE that identifies, that, can, that distinguishes out the programs that are meeting a minimum standard for safety and clinical services versus those that aren't. And so that would be my first response is that you, you, want, to, you want to vet your program. Find one that's accredited, find one that's licensed. That's your starting point. Um, so in terms of the, the kind of the weight and the back pain, if you're going to uh, a state that's licensed and accredited, um, they have standards around the weights of the backpack. Um, that child wouldn't be carrying, and in a licensed accredited program, they wouldn't be carrying more than 20% of their body weight, which is well within, you know, the, the physical you know, expectations for teenagers and what they can handle and, and carry backpacking. And so, so that's one of the ways to manage some of those, you know, if, you know, if that is going on, you know, that's one of the ways to manage, you know, maybe, get, you know, the potential for a child to have been carrying too much weight. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah. So that, that's kind of, kind of my first thing is pick one that's licensed, pick one that's accredited. Those things are, are managed, um, and the standards around those to prevent if they, if that child was having to carry more weight than what they should, that stuff is managed through that. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is there's been um, quite a bit of research um, oh, about the safety and the track record of, of wilderness programs. And if you compare a wilderness therapy program um, to other activities, um, the rates of incidents are surprisingly low. You know, if you're if you're comparing a wilderness program to just going backpacking with your friends, you're 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 half as likely to experience an injury in a in a program, a regulated program, versus just going backpacking with your friends. You are you know you're you're four times less likely to be injured in a wilderness program than you are doing you know snow sports. Um, you're 140 times less likely to experience an injury playing in a wilderness program versus playing football. And so for starters, the, the, they're very safe. And this is based off of, you know, over a decade of research on multiple programs. The rates of incidents are really low. Um, the other thing that wilderness programs are really good at is managing the health. Um, kids that come into wilderness programs, they leave healthier. You know, in the last two years, we've had two great studies that have come out that have shown kids that come in that are underweight, they gain weight. Kids that are overweight, they lose weight. Kids that come into wilderness program, they move towards a healthy body composition. Um, and so, you know, in terms of combating some of those, you know, what if, is my kid going to be safe? Are they going to be healthy? Um, there's, there's good research out there right now from accredited and licensed programs saying, no, this is safe. It's healthy. It is dirty. You know, it's not three days worth of dirt. You know, again, a licensed program, your kids are showering at minimum twice a week. Um, but you, nonetheless, you are still at some level dirty, but it's, it's not, um, I guess in short, there are risks, but when you compare it to other things, the risks are fairly moderate and it is a healthy and safe environment for adolescents. All right. Thank you, Steve. And, and actually, before, Mark, what, one of the things that I would like to hear from you, but we're going to take a break first, but... I think this is the perfect time for you to really be able to talk about the importance of an educational consultant and why having somebody who has gone out to all of these programs, who has been in the industry a long time, and who knows the difference and knows which ones are licensed and are have been working with uh, with young people uh, and been very su successful with that. I think that, that that's a huge point to bring up, and we're going to do that right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. 
Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Our guests today are Dr. Mark Burdick and Dr. Stephen DeMille. And the subject is 10 Steps to Wilderness Therapy. And as we mentioned before, uh, for those of you that are out there, uh, if you want to get the book, Dr. Burdick has 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 very, very nicely uh, offered the ability to be able to download the ebook for free. And uh, again, if you're out there driving, it's on our website. You can go to the Answers for the Family website. We have set up a link so that you will be able to go directly to there and download the book for free. And again, we're very thankful for that. Now, when we went to break, we were talking a little bit about uh, we we had a listener uh, question that had talked about the fact that they knew somebody who had talked about uh, kind of injuring their back and things and it really took took us in and and Stephen was talking about the fact that you know there is licensing there is there is levels of professionalism out there and that's one of the biggest reasons why getting an educational consultant that spends so much of their time knowing the different nuances of these different programs is so important and I'd like uh, Dr. Burdick to share a little bit more on that part of the, the decision-making process. Well, thank you, Ellen. This is, this is Mark again. And I would say to Pat in L.A., just so we don't lose her attention, that, you know, it's, a, it's important that we look at not only the place, but we look at the well-being and the relationship that the child will have with the purpose in the program. And when I services to families um, as an educational psychologist, educational consultant, I spend time with that family and with that individual child, hearing them out, understanding what their concerns are, and then making qualified recommendations based on what they're telling me. So kind of pulling it back, pulling it back before you decide on a program, you really have to decide on the best course of treatment. And the best and the best placement, and that is the reason that you would go to someone who's qualified as a referral source. And in my book, again, when you can download this, I actually have a chapter there that speaks to the child and says, "Here's what you can expect, and here's what they want to hear, and here's the type of therapist that you're going to be engaging with while you're there, so that we don't have these myths floating around and we don't have these great unknowns." And that's the point of having an education consultant, a referring professional who can take the time, hear the child, hear the family out, come up with a plan, come up with guidance based on what they're telling you. And so honestly, it isn't that difficult then um, with certain children who are on the fence to say, how does this sound to you? And they'll go, you know what? That doesn't sound half bad. And I've actually gone to the extent of having to do a phone call with the with the programmer with the therapist and and getting that level of, of anxiety and and pat i think that's what i heard from your question was it, it was about anxiety it's about where am i going to be what am i going to be asked to do what are my challenges going to be and if you can explain that on the front end then you don't have any surprises and you take the myth away and you get to a qualified program such as red cliff and you introduce them to the therapist ahead of time you know, this can go smoothly. It doesn't have to be a difficult, difficult situation. Although, Alan, I think you know that we, not everybody is, is uh, 
you know, head over heels to go uh, necessarily away from home and their gadgets and, and such. But, you know, just in terms of, and I give a whole list of resources to, to parents within the book that they can go um, to, to find somebody who's qualified. And I just want to, I want to caution parents and here's my opportunity. Just don't go it alone and just don't take whatever the neighbor says or with, you know, a relative, you know, three times removed, do your own research, find someone who's qualified that can work not only through the wilderness program, but the aftercare, because that's where you're headed. You can't expect a quick fix, you know, from a program. You're certainly going to get the behaviors, uh, adjustment in behaviors. You're going to get the kids with much more motivated, much more, much better uh, attitude. Things are going to look very rosy. But if they go back to the same situation again, you best have an aftercare um, established. And if they go on to a, a boarding school or a residential treatment, then you'll t- have someone there who's been there. And I've traveled. I, I doubt there's seriously there has been a there's not a program that I haven't been to that's a qualified program. Yes, there may be a mom and pop somewhere in you know some some distant state, but. You know, I've spent, you know, decades um, reviewing, uh, interviewing, um, you know, programs, therapists, uh, directors of programs. And I, you have the knowledge, you have the experience of saying this would be the type of program this child needs. And this is what we can expect versus here are three programs, any of them that will do just as well as the other one. Good luck to you. And I think that's an unethical uh, place to be. You want to make sure that parents are fully informed, that the kids are informed, and that they then make uh, a decision based on the best qualified information. Please download the book and, and, and shuffle through it and get some answers for yourself. And then uh, you'll, you'll find somebody. Somebody will come up, and you, anybody uh, you know is welcome to, to ask you know, for me for you know, a recommendation of somebody within their geographic area. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not territorial. I don't, I don't try to, to be the answer to everyone and neither does Steve with Redcliffe because we know there are other programs out there and there are other professionals that do a really good job. Well, and I want to sh- just share that that's to me, one of the reasons why I wanted the two of you on here, but, but also the fact that the book is really that sort of first step that I think for many of the parents because we get so many of them that will ask us and they're asking us at the at the investigative level to where we've just located their child who has run away and they're asking us and and I'm explaining to them you know that's the equivalent of malpractice for me to then start talking about a program because I don't know your child you know, I don't know. I know that they're, they say, well, you've been in this business for 30 years. You should know all the good programs. Yeah, I know there's lots of good programs, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are the best fit for your child. And that is why there are some incredible educational consultants out there that, as Mark is saying, goes out to the programs, spends time with them, knows all the different nuances about them that helps you as the parent make an educated decision for the overall success for your child. So that's why I think it's just so wonderful that the, the, the book is out there. It, it gives you a starting point, but at the same time, you have people available out there to you who are focused on the success for your family and for your child. So again, I want to thank you for that, Mark. Uh, now, I just I'll, want to... Can I just add... Please. I add just one of the things about this is Mark again. I just want to say the reason for the book is really to save you time and money uh, as parents and, and to, to get you the education, at least guide you to places you can get that education for yourself so that you're not one of those that comes back and says, oh, you know, I sent my child away to such and such program, you know, and nothing, nothing changed. That's the last thing that you know you want to hear as a parent that's the last thing that a professional wants to hear and it's the first question that i have is where did you get your guidance who did you invest your time and money in because to me that's the important first step is really making you know um an opportunity to connect with somebody who knows this this world so thank you for the opportunity alan for us to even to do this with the uh talk radio 
Uh, you're very welcome. And and Stephen, I think one of the the questions that comes up is, why does it work? I mean, why does wilderness therapy work? And again, if you can just g- give us sort of the you know the, the Cliff Notes version for the parents out there, because for a lot of people, it's hard to visualize this. So why does it work? And kind of kind of deconstruct some of the myths that some people may have heard out there. Yeah. Oh, excellent. So let me start with deconstructing the myth. So when you're talking wilderness therapy, you're not talking boot camp or adventure camp or any of those models that's based on a kind of break, like that's based on this philosophy that you have to break them down in order for any change to happen. That's not wilderness therapy. That's not what it does. Actually, what works about wilderness therapy is we put them in an environment to where they can start connecting. They start learning to connect to themselves, their peers, their therapists, their family. And it's in that context that they start to change. When they're away from all of their distractions, all of their problems, they actually start to reconnect with people in meaningful ways. And in, in all of the research that's been done about how wilderness therapy works, it keeps coming back that the environment allows kids to reconnect and it's the relationships and connections that they build that leads to their change. Um, and so in order for wilderness therapy to work, it's about relationships. It's about the unique types of relationships that you build in a community that's created in wilderness therapy with both the staff, the therapists, as well as the peers that they have in their community. They're interacting with peers in a way that they haven't in the past. And they're getting feedback and there's this level of interdependency and self-sufficiency that's occurring in a wilderness therapy program that promotes these other things that we're looking at, the self-confidence, the internal locus of control, and some of these other, the resilience, some of these other outcomes of wilderness therapy. But at its core... Well, well, Stephen, how does that then translate back to the parents? Because that becomes an issue, I think, for many of us, we understand... Okay, that, you know, they're they're going in, they're learning a new community. The parents love this because it's getting away from whoever that other community was that they were hanging with at school that was not taking them down the right path. But now one of the things that I love about this industry and, and the way in which it's come forward over the last 30 years is taking that knowledge and then with aftercare transferring it over to where it's something that now sticks better with the whole family once they come back. If you can share a little bit about that, uh, and, and Mark, I'd also like to hear from you on that subject as well. Great. So, excellent. So again, this is Stephen. Um, transitioning from the wilderness back home or to whatever it is begins the first day that they arrive. The interventions are built to be generalizable, the relationships that they're building. Um, And particularly and specifically for the family, um, the family is engaged in family therapy along the way. So at Reckless Youth, the narrative family therapy approach, where every week the family is telling and retelling their story. We're looking for problems that are existing, you know, problems within the family story that's enabling the dysfunction. And the family um, is beginning to reconnect with each other on an emotional level, even though they're thousands of miles away. And then there's lots of ceremony and rites of passage to reunite the family and transition them out. Um, And so it's done through just the day-to-day interventions that we use to foster foster generalization. It's done through the family therapy, and then it's done through the rituals and ceremonies around transitioning. And in addition to that, the, the, the individual therapist that each kid is assigned to work with, um, there's a transition plan that includes the family, the consultant, you know, what, and it's, it's not a train and hope model or mentality. It's not, let's give them these great experiences and then move on. You know, like I, I mentioned this before, but there's a lot of assessment going on. We have a much greater understanding. And part of creating that understanding is this is what this, is what this kid, this is what this child or young adult needs going forward. And so there's a plan mapped out for them going out that involves the family and the educational consultant. And whether that's going back home with continued support, whether that's going to a boarding school or whatever it is, a recovery program, that that is an intentional part of the process. Okay. And, and Mark, can you, can you address that a little bit? 
I think one thing that I, I do in my practice, which may be a little different, um, is that I really do believe that the process goes much smoother when you engage a therapist at home. And, I, and Alan, you know you've had Neil Brown on to do a talk on the parent uh, team control battle. Mm-hmm. And I use um, Neil as a licensed therapist to work with the family during the course of the treatment and the wilderness because I think it's important to have that face-to-face um, activity happening. And that, that's, to, to me, the way that you build in the support because when the, the child is going to re- return home, you want to make sure that you know, the, the, the family has changed, the, the dynamics have changed, everybody has gotten you know, their education, um, and they have their own therapy. And as that goes forward uh, between the program and the home, you want to have a very healthy system, as, as Stephen has outlined, and you can do that successfully better, I think, if you use, you know, a local therapist that, that's there for the family as they're going through this through the program itself. Um, so what we're talking about is is taking it takes a village. Mm-hmm. You know, we have we have to have a lot of people that um, starting with transport, uh, which is honestly one of the the, the first health, could be a very healthy step. Uh, for families because it it, 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 uh, it puts a light on what's happening within those, those family dynamics and it gives a safe escort to the to the program. Then you have a qualified licensed program um, such as Red Cliff and you have a licensed professional such as myself or whomever that are guiding this process and that just ups your, your chances along with a, a local therapist to make to make this a success. Nobody wants a failure. Uh, in this business. What, what we really want is a success story that just takes this one step further to one other family that has a need that, that they can't, they can't get behind. It's that they're too, to the too far in front of it to see it accurately. And this is what it's all about. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. I want to share one more, uh, uh, listener comment that came in, uh, And then I have a a quick question, but this one reads, I was a counselor at a wilderness program in Utah for three years before finishing my degree. I just wanted to say it was a great and uplifting experience for the counselors as well as the the kids we worked with. Up after they were in their 20s, thanking me for my part in helping turn their lives around. And then in quotes, wilderness works. And that's from Gary in Utah. Gary, thank you so much for that comment. Uh, and then, Mark, I think we've got about uh, about a minute now. Um, what would you say is probably the most important step uh, to wilderness therapy that many of the parents miss or just don't think of, something that's uh, covered in the book uh, that you can share? Um, this is Mark again, and I, and I think that the, the piece that they're going to miss is that if, if you look at um, the way that the, the programs um, want to help uh, families, uh, you're going to see that there's, um, on the front end, there, there's a lot of these scriptures that say that we can work with kids that have, you know, this type of condition, this kind of condition, and I think what parents probably don't realize that is that, you know, even though that, that there are programs, there's, there's programs out there that can effectively reach um, the individual, you know, child themselves and the family, that it's really a matter of a longer term process and that you can save so much on the front end if you use someone to help to, to direct you and guide you. And I know that it may look like an additional expense um, for families, but the reality is that you get the you get the value back um, ten, tenfold over because you have now someone who's going to be there for you and work with you during the process. So, just my suggestion, I've seen this again and again, is that parents don't stop to think, how am I going to effectively work this by myself? Um, if I went to file my taxes, you know, could I do it by myself or do I need an accountant? I think it's money well spent to have someone who can help to guide you. 
Very wise, <laughs> very wise, especially when you associate it with accountant, because I know that I wouldn't want to try to do that on my own. Again, thank you for both. Thank you to both of you, thank you uh, for, for coming on. Um, again, if you want to get more information, you can go to uh, either drburdick.com or AmericanPsychologist.nl, which is for Netherlands. Uh, but again, all this information will be at our site, theanswersforthefamily.com, uh, as well as an opportunity to be able to download uh, the free ebook, which is 10 Steps to Wilderness Therapy. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Alan, thank you. It was a pleasure. You're very welcome. And for everybody out there, be sure that you put on your calendar to tune in next Monday, August 7th, when we will be joined by Diane Peabody Straw, Executive Director of the Women's Museum of California, to discuss from historical education to immersive multimedia. And please share our shows with your friends by visiting the Answers for the Family site or catch our latest shows on iTunes, where if you leave a review, it will increase our iTunes rankings and help us to expand our reach so that we can help more families. You may also subscribe or resubmit your name to download your free copy of the Attitude of Gratitude Journal. It's a 21-day guide to achieving the quality of thankfulness through self-discovery. And last but not least, the next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page and let us know what you think about the show. Be good human beings. Do something nice for somebody this week. Have a great day. Bye now. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio.